title of the message tonight is Foreigners in the U.S. Foreigners in the U.S. And uh, I don't know if I was at some independent Baptist churches, they'd say, Amen, because they think I'm preaching something completely different than what I am. <laughs> okay, Foreigners in the U.S. Uh, um, just give me a, because of what we're going to be doing in the month of August, this has been obviously on my mind. And, and uh, it, this last Sunday, I started out, kind of down this road already. So Sunday school in Iola, we talked about the idea of strangers in the Bible. So some of the stuff that I talked about there will will be in the message tonight. And then um, we talked about Sunday night in Iola, the Bible command to love our neighbors. And that'll come up a little bit as well. So uh, all this is kind of fitting together, I hope you, you can see. And then uh, next week, we'll really kind of give an introduction as to what we're trying to see in uh, the month of August. But the idea of foreigners in the United States, I think it's important as Christians that we think about this. Let me give you some stats, um, you know, the, as much as you can believe stats that are taken online, sometimes it's hard to know how they get their information. But uh, as of 2019, I think it is, uh, here, are, here were the stats, okay? The USA has over 40 million people who were foreign born. Okay, born somewhere else, but then they ended up in the United States. That represents about 13% of our country are people who were born on a foreign land somewhere, and now they're here. Uh, so f- interesting thought here is 42% of those foreigners are, uh, uh, speak Spanish. 42% of all the foreigners, you know, which is, represents a you know, significant portion of our, of our country, so I watched this thing on YouTube. Uh, I posted a link to it on Facebook, but uh, it's it's pretty interesting. It shows over history, according to all the facts of the research and all, uh, in in the stats of how you know how many um, immigrants came. It goes all the way back to like the 1800s or something like that, and how many you know f- Im- immigrated to the to the United States from different countries. And of course, you had. Ireland was huge back then, and and uh, you had a lot of uh, European countries, uh, and it, it's got all like the top maybe fifteen or ten or fifteen I can't remember like the top uh, uh, countries that are represented, you know, of those immigrants who came here, and you can see like the the graph goes as it as it goes through the different years. The years are showing, you know, and and each time it's showing the number amount in the bar graph, you know, goes a little bit far. So the one on top at some point it's Russia. I mean, in the 19, uh, I don't know when that when that whole crisis was, but uh, you know, there's a big time where Russia was really coming in, and and, and so whoever is like. Uh, it, 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 the most immigrants, all of a sudden that bar graph, it, that part jumps up to the top. And so it's pretty interesting. For a long time, Ireland is way up there. And, and then eventually you just see Mexico. And Mexico just goes, and all of a sudden we have today uh, so the Spanish, Spanish-speaking population. Like I said, 42% of all those who are foreign-born speak Spanish. And, of course, that's that's just a representation of of Spanish-speaking countries, primarily Mexico, uh, or uh, you know, some places, El Salvador, or whatever. Typically, there's like political unrest or something like that, and they end up coming. The guy from Africa that we talked about at that market today, you know, we were talking about how many uh, people fled Ethiopia, you know, because of political unrest, and and a lot of times they end up coming to the United States. Now, some Americans don't like that. Some Americans, you know, are like, hey, we need we need to shut down all of our borders. We need to stop letting people in and all that. Now, the majority of people that, that say that are like, we need to stop letting them in illegally. It's not like well, they can't come, but they need to go through the process and all that. Uh, but this is something that we see a lot. Okay, so uh, here's what another statistic showed. Of all of the foreign-born uh, folks, the foreigners, they're, well, they're not all foreigners, but they were foreign-born in our land, 23% are here illegally, all right? So you meet some, you know, out of, out of 10 people that you find, you know, who are born from a foreign land, you might get a couple of those who are uh, here illegally. We all know that. We, you know, we understand that. We just realize nobody asks questions, uh, but we know that's probably the case. Almost 30% of them are lawful uh, permanent residents by marriage, by birth, or whatever. Because here's the thing. You know, maybe the maybe one generation they're here, they're foreign-born, uh, but now they're 
you know, either illegally or, or legally in the United States, and then they have a child who's born in the United States. Now that child is is not foreign born. That child is, is here, so they're natural born citizen. And uh, so, uh, uh, so t- almost 30% are here as permanent residents l- lawfully by marriage, birth, something like that. And then there's a... Uh, uh, that leaves 5% who are just temporary residents and 45% who have naturalized. They've gone through the process. They've become citizens. That doesn't say whether or not they started out that way, but that's they have made it through that, that system. Okay, But the fact is there are a lot of people in the United States who were foreign born, and now we see them, hey, English isn't their first language. You know, they... They might dress differently, have a different culture than what we're used to or whatever. But you say, well, how, why are they all here? You know, what brought them to the United States? If you really think about it as, a, as an American citizen, it's silly for us to even ask that. Why? Because all of us, if we trace our ancestry, <laughs> we came here the same way. We came here at some point as immigrants. You know, you could fight, you can argue about whether or not, you know, the legal or illegal or whatever. That's not the point. What brings them to the United States? Simple. The American dream. <laughs> they want to come to the United States and make something of themselves. They didn't like it where they are, you know. And as much as, you know, the, uh, it seems sometimes like our political leaders are trying to destroy the United States, uh, the whole world still sees the United States. And as much as the, the world talks bad about the United States, because there are a lot of bad things you can say about the United States, but as much as that's out there, as much as uh, oh, we don't even like a lot of what goes on in the United States, why is it that everybody wants to come, come to the United States? Because living in their country isn't as pleasing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not the, they're looking for that American dream. Uh, I saw a little clip of somebody, uh, you know, I hate to even admit this, but I, I did, okay. I saw a clip of somebody who was competing on like America's Got Talent, that kind of an idea. Uh, I don't watch the show, but I saw this. And this person said they were French Canadian and they were, trying to compete, you know, to get America's Got Talent. And I was thinking, well, they're not even American. What are they doing? And the person said, what brings you here? They said, well, I'm trying to find the American dream, right? Well, uh, that's easy to say because, you know, you're, you're, but isn't it true? Everybody wants to live that American dream. Like I can succeed and all that. So let's talk about that American dream that we hear. All right. Obviously, Many of our ancestors came here seeking religious freedom or escaping war or there be, you know, many, many people became indentured servants. You know, they said, hey, take me with you to the, to the United States or, you know, they worked out some kind of agreement and said, we want to go there. We'll be your indentured servant so that we can live in the United States because we don't want to live in poverty in our own land or whatever. And I'm not going to get into this because it could be emotional for some people. It could be, uh, well, I am getting into it, but it could be emotional for some people. Some people get really offended when you talk about this. But if you trace slavery in the United States and you really think about slavery, look, I'm against people owning somebody as that's their property and they treat them bad and all that kind of stuff. Obviously that's wrong. I'm against going somewhere and and kidnapping somebody like this human trafficking and and taking them. The Bible says those people ought to be put to death, right? Kid, uh, 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 man uh, stealers, you know, people that would do that, disgusting. Uh, you know, wicked people. All right. But, but a lot of people that were here that came to the United States and were slaves were here either by their own choice or their family members sold them because they said, that's the only way you're going to live is to be somebody's slave. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because that's what we read in the Bible. That was the Jews where God gave commands about that and said, hey, if you're somebody, you know, uh, from your people, you know, is destitute or whatever, then you can buy them as a servant and all that stuff. It sounds so wicked to us because we've heard so much negativity on that subject that we don't think that, that could, there could ever be good. And so I've heard people actually say, how could you believe in the Bible? Don't you know the Bible like, uh, you know, allows slavery and all this kind of stuff and, and, and it promotes it and all this. No, you don't understand because you've lived in America all your life and you've had, you know, the liver, liberty and the luxury and you never had to, had to. But if people are starving, they will sell their kids. They will do whatever they can. And a lot of people ended up in the United States uh, because of that. They, do, they want to do escape poverty or whatever. The idea of the American dream is rooted in uh, the proclamation of declaration. Uh, I mean, the, the proclamation that we find in the Declaration of Independence that says all men are created equal, right? 
we're familiar with that. Everyone talks about that. Or, you know, we're, we have the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Uh, these are the things that we hear all the time. Uh, if you get to the United States and you ever go to, I've never been to, well, I've been in New York real briefly, but I've never been there. I never saw the Statue of Liberty. If you see the Statue of Liberty, there's something on the, uh, uh, like a placard on the Statue of Liberty that's really famous, a, uh, a poem that was written for it. Uh, maybe it was a song. I can't remember. But it was written on there, the New Colossus, okay? So Colossus, you think about something that's colossal, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. The idea is just simply a, a giant statue, <laughs> okay? So that's the idea. And the New Colossus, it reads this. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea wash sunset gates shall stand. A mighty woman uh, with a torch whose flame in, in, is the imprisoned lightning in her name. I'm messing this up the, the rhythm on this really bad. Mother of exiles from her beacon hand. Glow worldwide welcome, her mild eyes uh, command. The air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, she cries with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Uh, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed, to me. I, will, I, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And the idea is it's, just an, it's a welcome, basically, to uh, the, the, those in the world who are less fortunate, saying, hey, give me your poor, give me your tired, give me your yearning to be free. Like, you know, we're holding the light for you. We want you to come. We're not looking for like the, the grandiose, you know, uh, uh, just we just want to be a, a, a help. So this is beautiful, right? It's a, it's a great idea. It's a great principle. But let me tell you this. As much as I love America, just for the sense that I'm born here, I appreciate the freedoms. Everybody has a little bit of ethnocentric, centric, you know, views. Uh, as much as I love America, look, there are holes from a Christian standpoint in the Declaration of, Liber uh, of Independence. There are holes in our Constitution. There are holes in everything that we, you know. Now, look, there are some people that would be like, "How can you say that? Like, is inspired by God? Like, look, the Constitution is not my Bible." Right. The uh, Declaration of Independence is not my creed, you know, or something like that. Uh, the, the Statue of Liberty is not my idol. The United States is not my God. Right? I, I am not. That's that's not who we are as Christians. And, and a lot of this message is going to be about that. But the main point is, as Bible believing Christians, at some point, we're going to, as the fact that our whole purpose is ministering to people and evangelizing and all, we're going to come in contact with foreigners, people who maybe don't speak our language, people who have a different culture, were raised with a different religion, you know, and all, and, and, and we are going to have to be faced with that. And so the idea is what, from a biblical standpoint, shall we, should be our take on foreigners, foreigners in the United States, but basically from a Christian point of view is what, where I'm getting at. Okay. So number one, the first point I want to make is this somewhat of a alliterated text. They all start with R, but I don't know how memorable it'll be, but just bear with me. Okay. Number one is this, remember who we are as Christians. We need to remember who we are. Number one, that means, Hey, I'm not American first, right? I'm not, I'm Christian first. As you know, I God is my supreme. Okay, it's not the United States or the the leaderscape. So we need to remember who we are. And the Bible makes it very clear: we're foreigners in this land, whatever land we're in. As Christians, we're foreigners. By the way, this is interesting. But as much as uh, America likes to promise life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, as much as they are all for liberty and rights for everybody, guess who they don't really want to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Bible believers, who the, guy, the ones that preach the Bible and they're kind of like the, the hard-headed, you know, hey, this is what the Bible says and they're preaching. No, we don't want those guys to be happy. We don't want those guys to have freedom of speech and all that. We don't want them because uh, why? Because they're preaching that, hey, I don't care what the, you know, Declaration of Independence says, not everybody is going to have the right to uh, life, uh, uh, the pursuit of happiness and life and liberty and all those kinds of things. All right. We, we go by what the Bible says, 
not by what the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or anything like that says. So we must remember, first and foremost, who we are. It's okay to be proud of being American. It's okay to, to love the way that our country's set up. If you do and you're thinking, hey, this is the best country and the best system, look, whatever, that's fine. But I'm separating right now your legal citizenship by the fact that you are a spiritual citizen of heaven. You are a spiritual citizen of, you know, and God is your supreme ruler if you're saved. Uh, we are part of the kingdom of God already. I know it's a, something that's not going to come on earth till much later, but in your hearts, you are part of that kingdom. And so as such, we need to remember that's who we are first and foremost and not let our national pride or whatever get in, in the way. Okay. And I'm not even touching on the fact that, you know, that's kind of who, what America is, is like a melting pot, you know, of people of all different cultures and ethnicities. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, in many ways, if you think about this as Christians, right, I'm not preaching on replacement theology or covenant theology or whatever you want to call it, but in many ways, if you think about this, Christians pick up where Jews left off. Christians pick up where the Old Testament saints uh, uh, left off, okay? I'll preach a message on that, you know, sometime, hopefully not too, not too long from now, because it is interesting. We need to make sure we understand this. Plus, I've been listening to some preaching that's made me really mad because I'm like, no, you don't understand. So we're going we're gonna to preach on that topic. But here is uh, uh, what the Bible says. Hebrews 11, 13, of course, this is to Christians, but it's talking about those Old Testament saints, those heroes, uh, the Hebrew heroes, you know, of the Old Testament. And it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What do you mean? Abraham was a stranger? God promised him the promised land. And he even, you know, and, and his descendants went into the promised land. Well, here's the thing. God also told Abraham, hey, for 400 years... Your people are going to wander in uh, in the in the wilderness, or I don't remember the exact wording that he uses, but basically pro prophesying that they're going to go in Egypt and they're going to be strangers and they're going to be slaves and they're going to be you know uh, treated badly and all that stuff. And guess what? They came out of Egypt, wandered around for forty years, ended up in the Promised Land. Yay! They're finally in the Promised Land. Yeah, but even in Canaan Land, the Promised Land, they ended up. Many times, you know, being ruled by different people, the Philistines or something like that. And then eventually they end up in Babylonian uh, captivity. They're, they're in Babylon. They don't have any say over anything. Jeremiah and other prophets are saying, you know what, just get comfortable because you're going to be here for a long time. You know, just get settled in and stay here. Uh, you know, you're going to be just, you're going to be foreigners, but you're going to be in this. You're not going to have your own land. You're going to be here. So that's what happens. They get out, obviously, they end up, even in Jesus' day, they're in, uh, under Roman control. But if you think about it, in many ways, the Jews, even though they were in their land, they were allowed to be in their land as they walked the streets. In many ways, they're strangers, pilgrims, and they didn't belong there from the Romans' point of view. You know, I mean, they were allowed to be there, but it was like, hey, this isn't your land, this is our land. <clears throat> and so this is just how uh, it was with, in the Old Testament. But it really didn't change after Jesus. The disciples were clearly pilgrim strangers in this land. Uh, and, and then we, we follow that through today. We walk around in this world. You might be citizens. You know, you might be, uh, but the Bible, according to the Bible, you could be a stranger in your own home. You know, Jesus, Jesus' own brothers didn't, didn't uh, believe in him. And uh, we, could, uh, we could easily uh, be in a situation, your community, your neighborhood. You're like, hey, I belong to this community. Yeah, but as a Bible-believing Christian, according to the Bible, if you follow Jesus Christ, you are not going to always fit in. You are not always going to be welcomed. You are often going to be persecuted. That's just a Bible uh, promise that's given. Okay, and as strangers, here's what the Old Testament saints were commanded by God. Look at Exodus 22. Exodus 22, and look at verse 21. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. He's saying, look, you should know what it's like. 
you're a you were strangers. And so as a result, when you get come across a stranger, don't vex them. Don't, you know, in fact, if you follow the history, like they allowed a lot of people who weren't Jews to live among them. Right. And that's why every time they left the land, they can't, they left the land of Egypt. What happened? They came with a mixed multitude. Some Egyptians actually followed them, whether by birth or, or uh, just, tr just wanted to go with them because they saw the power of God. I don't know, but they had a mixed multitude among them. When they left Babylon and came back into the land, you know, because we, we read in Esther that a lot of people converted to become Jews. And, uh, cause, and they feared God. And so we see when they go back into the land af after Babylonian captivity, they've got strangers among them, people living among them, right? And so this was the way it was supposed to be. It's like, hey, you were a stranger, so treat strangers well. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy 10, verse 19 it says, Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So he's saying, look, you, you just love the stranger. Now, I, I personally, uh, I feel, and I don't know, maybe it's because I grew up and spent a fair amount of time in Japan, um, you know, or maybe because I felt like I was called to the mission field. I was going to go to Africa, you know. So I've always had a, a kind of a desire and a heart for, for other countries and all that. But... When I knock on a door and somebody comes out and you're like, hey, they don't speak English. That's not their first language. Or, or you know, there's just the smell and you're like a, like a different country. I can smell the, uh, the spices or something like that. Or, or you see like even their statues or whatever, which I know that's pagan. I know that they, it's idolatry. It's all these things. But I see them and I have a soft spot in my heart and I'm just kind of like, oh, these guys are foreigners. You know what I mean? And I feel almost like a kindred spirits in the sense that like, hey, I know what it's like to be a foreigner. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Like, uh, like I know there's people that could listen to this and be like, oh, that's treason. <laughs> you know what? You love other countries and, and other people from foreign lands. Look, again, it's ridiculous to even think that way because we're all for we've all foreigners who at some point left the country where uh, depending on how far back you go and moved here, you know. You say, uh-uh, oh, my ancestors were native Indians. Well, guess what? They moved here from <laughs> Siberia or whatever. You know, there's different places uh, that they came from. But, uh, but they, that look, we all, everybody came to this land with the same idea. I want to go someplace where I can be free, live the dream, and all that kind of stuff. And so we want to welcome them. We want to be hospitable. We want to be nice. In fact, the Bible also says, well, in fact, you know, I, I didn't go here. Look at 1 Peter. Talking about being strangers, we should be able to relate to that. <clears throat> First Peter, oh, I'm in Second Peter. It's Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia. In Bithynia. Now, somebody might say, oh, it's the strangers. That's the diaspora. That's the Jews that were scattered in the land. Like, this book is to the Jews. It's not to Christians. There are people that believe that. There are people that teach that. But I don't know how you could read First and Second Peter and not feel like he's talking to Christians. There's no doubt about that. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. <laughs> And so, like, you just would have to read this whole, these whole two chapters and understand he's clearly talking to believers, and not just Jew, Jews who converted to Christianity. He's talking to believers and saying, hey, you weren't a nation, and now you are a nation, and, and, uh, and it's Christ because you put your faith in Christ and all that. But here it says in chapter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your, your soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, uh, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You say, oh, see, he's saying though those Gentiles. So he's saying you're Jews and they're Gentiles. Well, let me say, were the Jew who was being persecuted? <laughs> or I mean, I should say, who was persecuting the Christians? The Jews were. So he's clearly not talking about the Jews that existed in that time. He's calling 
the, the believers, he's saying, hey, you're not Gentiles anymore. You're part of, uh, of the Lord's people. Anyway, you have to go through First uh, Peter and, and, and see for yourself. But clearly, he's talking to the church saying that you're strangers and, uh, and uh, you should, should, should know what that's like, right? Whenever you come across strangers is, is the application that I want to make. All right, so number two, first of all is remember, okay? Remember who we are foreigners in this land. We're, we're Christians first. We're not just Americans, uh, and that's not our religion, okay? Unfortunately, there's a lot of Baptists out there who, who have made being an American uh, their religion, and it's really sad that they, that they go that far. <clears throat> I could go off about the American flag and all this kind of stuff, but I'm not going to. <laughs> you already know where I am on that. Number two, recognize the opportunity. Okay, realize who you are. Now, rep recognize, part number two, recognize the opportunity that you have. Okay? And I'm talking about from a missiological standpoint, like a, like a missions, from a missions-minded standpoint, you know, think about the opportunity. You've got people from, because, all right, at our, in, in Iola, We've got, I don't remember how many it is exactly. You've seen the plaques all over the wall with different missionaries representing different countries. Some of those missionaries have been, uh, been uh, sent out from the, well, they're not sent out from the church, but they're, you know, supported by the church for many, 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 many years. You know, they've been there. And, uh, and, and so we've got in our mind that missions looks like this. You know, we pay somebody a little bit of money so that they can go live on foreign soil and they can reach people with the gospel. All right. I'm not going to preach on on, on missions. Uh, I'm a mission minded and a mission hearted uh, pastor. I really am. But I do think and I'm going to start hitting on this throughout August and probably after that. We're going to think about that. I do think that we have we have to reconsider some of our thoughts and some of the things that we're doing towards world missions because they're not being effective like they like like we have a great opportunity to be you know nowadays and so from a, a mission standpoint do you realize people from all over the world are coming to the United States and they're living in little these little subcultures all over and you could go and you could reach them and maybe this community of Africans who are Muslim or, you know, these groups of uh, uh, Latinos who are uh, 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 Catholic, you know, or, you know, the Indians who are Hindu or whatever. If you went to their country and tried to give them the gospel, you would be in big trouble, right? You could get killed. You could get imprisoned. You could, uh, at the very least, get kicked out of the country in some of these, some of these regions for preaching the gospel to them. They are now here. And nobody can stop you from preaching to them. And since they know that, because a lot of times it's not the people that don't want to hear the gospel, it's the government. And so here, they don't have that. And what you find is when you talk to foreigners, a lot of times they are so open to hearing about the Bible. They wouldn't be if you were on their soil, but they're on your soil and you and you have that right to do that. Now, I know some are going to get hit by all kinds of things, but look, that's how it is. With missions too, you got Jehovah's Witnesses going to all the same countries that we're going to. You got the Charismatics, you got Catholics, you got people all over who are going out to the world also. And so here's no, no difference. They come here, they could be affected by all those things. Uh, you want to know where the Spanish-speaking population is in Kansas City? Let's say we got we're going on a soul-winning event. We want to know where are the communities where we can preach the gospel to Spanish-speaking communities. All you got to do is look for Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> you got a big Catholic church, you're going to have Spanish-speaking people all over there because they go to that church. That's how their culture is, all right? But we've gone into those neighborhoods and seen a lot of people get saved. We've seen a lot of people who go to the, that Catholic church confess to us that they have no idea why the Catholic church does the things that the Catholic church does, and they see the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel, and they say, wow, that makes sense to me. And they're willing to have that conversation without fear of some Catholic priest, because if you go to a third world country, you go to South America and you get into a neighborhood that's Catholic there and you're an independent Baptist and you try to go into that community and preach, you know, you, it's, it's, you talk about corruption in the United States. These other countries, it is corrupt. You're liable to get, you know, your house on fire or something like that. Uh, you know, people are going to be fined and, and all kinds of stuff because, uh, look, that's how it is in third world countries. And I'm not saying that we don't believe in missionaries going to third world countries. But what I'm saying is we are here right now 
And we have a humongous opportunity, just even in Kansas City alone, to go and reach people from other cultures. And I, I you know, theoretically, and I guess ideally, what would be awesome is, because some of those are just here temporarily, you know, at some point they're going to go back to their country. What if they got saved, they got involved in church, you know, and they went back and they're preaching the gospel in their country to people that they can preach to that we wouldn't be able to preach to maybe, you know. If you really think about it, if you, if you recognize the opportunity that we have, <clears throat> it's great. Now, look, uh, again, I'm going to be preaching on this in the next couple of weeks, but uh, there are dangers and kind of bad things that other cultures have brought into the United States. And I would even go as far as to say into Christianity, like tr genuine Christianity has been impacted and affected by Eastern religions and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, African religions and all that. So even the charismatic movement, man, you could, you could really make some ties there. There's a lot of influence that we've had. So on the American culture, and then more specifically uh, for our purposes, even churches and, and the just mindsets about, deal, about you know, religion and looking at scripture and everything, the danger is that other countries, all, other cultures all over the world have come here and they, they do bring with them their religions, their beliefs or whatever. But man, the opportunity outweighs that because as Christians, we, go to, we know that, you know, if you don't believe... If you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation and believed in the God of the Bible, then I don't care if you've got a, a statue of Mary. I don't care if you've got a Hindu shrine. I don't care if you've got, I don't know, what other religions uh, are out there. Uh, Buddha, you know, I, uh, I don't care what your belief is. I got to preach you to the gospel because, or I don't care if you're an atheist, right? I got to preach you the gospel because that's the only way you're going to get saved. And so I don't really care what bad religions you bring with you. You know, either that or you go to Europe and you can say, oh, hey, Europe is filled with people who don't believe in any religion. They don't believe in God at all, so many of them will claim. You know, look, you're going to preach the gospel to them too. <laughs> right? So it doesn't really matter. Uh, our job is to preach the gospel. And so let them come, you know. Yeah, but did you see that? Look, I've heard people talk like this. Did you see that, uh, you know, uh, that lady with a, a, a bag over her head, you know, talking about the Muslims with the... What's that even called? I forgot. Uh, hijab or whatever. And they got, uh, you know, people be like, oh, it's probably a terrorist. You know, watch out. Don't let them, you know, don't, the, if they've got a bag, you better be real careful because there might be a bomb in that bag or something like that. I've heard people talk like that, you know, and look, I'm not saying be dumb. I mean, if somebody looks like a terrorist, I guess you might want to ask some questions. And if they're, if they got something over their face, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's might be skeptical because you don't know who's behind that. But look, for the last year and however long people have been behind masks, <laughs> we don't know what they're doing. We don't know if they're robbing the store or whatever anyway. Uh, so I'm just saying it's ridiculous to be like scared about all oh, these foreigners. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Or, oh, they don't speak my language. Well, you don't speak their language. <laughs> I talked to the guy in Ethiopia uh, from Ethiopia today at that market, and uh, and I, I I couldn't remember what they speak in Ethiopia, but his English was so good. Of course, he's been he, he's been in the United States for like 16 years or something, but his English was so good that I thought, now do they speak English in Ethiopia? Because some countries they speak English, like they still speak a, a their native tongue as well, but they'll speak English primarily. They might be a little bit of a barrier, but depending on their level of education. And he said, no, 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 no. I had to learn it completely. You know, he said, but when we go to school, they do teach it. Kind of like in America, like every school teaches some Spanish uh, or some French. You might have some options, German or something like that. Obviously, Spanish is really pushed for obvious reasons. I just told you 40% of the uh, foreign-born folks in the United States speak Spanish. So, uh, so it's becoming, if you want a job, you know, one way to uh, an easier way to get up the ladder on a certain job is to be able to speak Spanish right now because you're going to be able to deal with Spanish speaking customers and uh, and that's a sought after field. So uh, where was I going with that? Uh, I kind of got off track. So anyway, <laughs> I don't know what I was saying. Anybody remember? Huh? Uh, yeah, but what was I saying? What about that was I saying? Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Ethiopia. So I talked to him, and he and I, he said, "No, I don't speak English." And I said, "So what language?" Valerie asked, "What language do you speak?" He said, "What their their main uh, language 
uh, was that they spoke there in Ethiopia. I can't remember the name of it. But I know this from studying African uh, countries before. There's a whole lot more than that. Like there might be a main language that they speak in a certain country in Africa, but usually there's like tons, sometimes like, like, you know, you know, 15 or you know, some places have been like a hundred dialects or something like that, that they speak in there. So I said, well, how many languages do you speak? And I don't remember what the answer was, but every African I've talked to, I would say averages to about four languages that they know. English, which a lot of times was the hardest one for them to learn, uh, their native tongue, some of them speak a trade language like Swahili or something like that because they can speak to more people in their country, you know, speaking that, you know, simple, kind of simple language. And then, you know, maybe just another neighboring, some or some of them speak French, you know, a lot of times. And so, uh, so good grief, man. Can you imagine learning all those languages? And then you're living in the United States and you're trying to have a conversation with somebody in English. And how often have you seen it? Like you've been in, yeah, the cashier line and uh, waiting to buy something and somebody's treating the person so rude because they're not speaking a hundred percent English. Like they're just like, really, what are you dumb or something? I mean, <laughs> I've seen it. Uh, this is a, this is just a, a common way that foreigners are treated here. And, uh, and so we got to be very careful as Christians. We got to recognize the opportunity we have to share Christ with them. Let them see. Now, like when they come, now some, some, uh, countries, some cultures, they think that if they go to the United States, that the United States is a Christian country because they think in those terms, like our country is a Muslim country, their country is a is a uh, Christian country, and, they, and this country is a Buddhist country. I mean, they think in those terms. So they think when they go to the United States that everybody in the United States is Christians, okay? And there are people that won't let their kids anywhere near a Christian because they think Christians are those people that they see in Hollywood when they watch t American TV, right? Unfortunately, it's looking more like that, isn't it, in churches today? But, uh, but we ought to be the shining light. You know, I'm, I've talked to Muslims that are just besides themselves that my wife and my daughter wear skirts and dresses, like long skirts and long dresses, because they're like, oh, man, I thought all Americans were like immodest. I thought they all like to show their legs and show their, you know, and it's like, no, actually the Bible teaches against that. <laughs> but you'd be surprised how many Muslims, they don't know that the Bible teaches against that. And they think that we're just be, you know, that Christianity is just full of, uh, of perversion. And that's what they're seeing represented, by the way, in their countries. We send ambassadors over there. And what are we sending to Africa? We're sending all these ambassadors that are trying to teach them to not criminalize homosexuality. You know, and they're going over there. They're sending, uh, you know, our, our, you know, American leaders are sending people, you know, as ambassadors of the United States who are homosexuals. And they're sending them to these countries where homosexuality is like thought of as a really bad thing. And they're like supposed to go there to convince these people that this is what America is doing. So look, we're not in a, in a Christian country. We're not. Okay. But we are to be the light of, to the world, right? Jesus is the light. And then when he left, he said, we're to be the light. We're supposed to be shining the light of Jesus to the world and saying, look, I mean, I talked to that Mexican today, uh, that Mexican guy who said, uh, you know, he grew up uh, uh, Catholic, but he never really st stayed with it. You know, he got into the working force, stopped going to church. He said, I didn't really believe it. I do believe in God, do believe in the Bible. Uh, he said, but I didn't really believe in all the crazy stuff that they were doing and everything. Yeah, no kidding. And so he said, uh, uh, you know, he was so have a conversation. Now, he had a really deep accent. He understood everything I was saying, but he had a real deep accent. It was kind of hard for me to... Uh, uh, to, to understand him. But as I, as I began to just kind of talk to him about the gospel and everything, uh, I got off track again, but uh, as I was talking to the gospel and thinking about just the fact that I have such a great opportunity here to show him that, hey, Christians don't believe what you've been taught. You know, Christians actually believe something different. I can show you from the Bible. You know, we don't believe you have to work to pay for your way to heaven because the Bible doesn't teach that. And I'm able to I'm able to show him where to be a light to the world and to show them, you know, that, hey, even uh, even all these other Christians in the United States uh, on these on some of these issues, they're wrong. <laughs> OK, but let me show you what the truth is. And we have the liberty to do that. And it's a great opportunity we not, need not to forget. Okay, so remember who you are. You're a foreigner and a pilgrim in this land if you're, if you're a believer following the Lord. <clears throat> number two, recognize the opportunity that we have. And number three, here's a simple point. Reciprocate the love of Christ that you've been shown. 
you know, we love him because he first loved us. Think about how much he loved us. Uh, think about the picture in Matthew 15. I want to read this one. On that last point uh, about the opportunity that we have, another thing I was thinking about was the fact that, you know, they come to our land instead of us going to their land. I thought about Halloween. <laughs> You know, we spend all of our time, like I hate Halloween, not endorsing it at all. But we spend all, you know, as much time as we can go knocking on doors and so that we can preach the gospel to them. And then on Halloween, they come and they knock on, on our doors. We ought to take advantage of that. <laughs> Be like, hey, can I give you something? <laughs> I'll give you a real treat. I'll give you the gospel. Okay, so uh, look at Matthew chapter 15. If you give them a gospel track and not candy, though, they're probably going to egg your house or something. I'm just saying. <clears throat> Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went hence and departed into the house of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered, he answered and said, I am not but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, we find out uh, where she is from in Mark specifically, and it says she's not, a, uh, she's not a Jew. So he's saying, I am sent but the, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered, he answered and said, it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now, it sounds like he's being very rude, but, but he's not, if you follow through what he's doing and what he's setting up here. And, he, and she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So you see this lady that was coming to Jesus and saying, look, I know that you can heal my child, you know. Uh, I'm just asking you for your mercy. And here Jesus is. The picture is pretty, is pretty great. Uh, this is in the gospel, so it's kind of a transitional time, you know, where, where God's like slowly not dealing with the Jews anymore because the Jews are rejecting Jesus Christ. But at that time, he's dealing with the Jewish people who were the, the believers, right? Now, obviously, a lot of them weren't. The Sadducees and the Pharisees and all, uh, they went... They were kind of getting off, off, but but a lot of the people that followed him, the disciples and others, were part of that Jewish faith because they were believing in the true God and the Messiah to come, and uh, and so he was primarily finding those, the lost children of Israel, and uh, and here's this lady who's not a Jew, and she's trying to reach out to him and trying to get him to to be a blessing. I mean, if you think about that, like in a manner of speaking. Uh, it's like God is on his way to heal somebody, if you read the story, uh, that's Jewish. And he's going to go, you know, is it Jairus' daughter? He's on his way to, I can't remember. And, uh, and, he's, and he's, he's headed that way, and he's going to do something. And here's this lady. I might be getting confused with the lady that is, uh, touches his garment. I can't remember. But, and she's begging him for mercy. And he grants some mercy. If you think about that, Romans 11 is kind of talking about the same way about how we've all been uh, grafted in. Now, we're in a different uh, situation now because of the way that the Jews rejected Christ and kind of fizzed out. So we don't want to get confused on that context of Romans 11 and not realize who Jesus was talking to in the time in which he was talking, I mean, uh, Paul was talking to, in the time in which he was talking because he was talking about the fact that there were still Jews there getting saved. And so he was saying, look, don't think that, you know, Jews can't get saved. They can, they can be saved. A lot of people get Romans 11 mixed up. But if you think what he's talking about, and he's saying to the those who weren't Jews, he's saying, hey, you've been grafted in. You know, you're part of this now. And if you think about that, like, where where would we be? I mean, all, all we know now is that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and we're saved. We're part of that true religion, all right? But where would we be had God not showed his mercy and sent Jesus Christ? And, the, and just his love to the whole world. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a great promise. What a great, uh, uh, you know, the gospel, I was telling the guy today, uh, those guys that I was talking to uh, when we were soul winning, I said, and you've probably thought about this, the same thing, but the gospel is so, 
inclusive in the sense that, hey, anybody can come to Christ. But it's exclusive because he says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So there's only one way that's very exclusive, but it's inclusive in that, hey, anybody can come to him. And so, you know, those who have opportunity to come to him, you know, he's granted an amazing amount of, of uh, grace. And so we've seen that grace bestowed upon us. And it only, look, hey, whether or not you ever are ever nice to uh, a foreigner, you know, whether or not you are ever a neighbor, you know, because the Bible tells us we're supposed to love our neighbors. And and I uh, just preached that in, in Iola about the the Good Samaritan. And and uh, even if you never do that, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're still saved. But if you're saved, like, doesn't it only make sense that you're going to try to show the love to others that Christ showed to you? And that's what he tells you to do. And so uh, and so we ought to reciprocate the love of Christ has been shown to us. In our text, back in, uh, I'm going to close here, Matthew 25. In the text that we started with, and this is another one that people get confused on, uh, confused with dispensationalism and stuff, but Matthew 15. Starting in verse 21, <clears throat> 21, he's talking to, um, I'm sorry, 25. I was about to read you the, uh, the Good Samaritan. Verse 35. <clears throat> and he's talking, and he's basically describing two camps of people. You've got the believers, all right? Sometimes believers are called just or they're called the righteous, you know, or, or whatever. And, and obviously, we're not righteous. You know, that's not what gets to us, the righteousness of Christ. But as a people of God, there are certain things that define us. Like among his people, there are people who do good works. And among the wicked, now look, we are all, even as Christians, we are guilty of sin. We're, we have wickedness in us, but that doesn't define who we are, especially now that we're in Christ. You know, that's not at all what defines us. But the wicked, no, even if they bring good works into the table or whatever, hey, they're, you know, those are works of iniquity. Those are sinful things. Defined as, you know, a specific type of person. That's the way I understand this, okay? So look at what he says here. When the Son of Man, verse uh, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous, uh, the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we uh, thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? Uh, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the, the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then uh, shall he say, to, then he goes and talks about the wicked. Okay, So, you know, even if I'm off a little bit on my interpretation of that, if you got another answer for what he's talking about here, I've heard a lot of uh, different theories on that. Here's what we know. Jesus is saying, hey, when you did something to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And so when he talks about taking in the strangers and, and, and feeding the, 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 the hungry and taking care of the poor, you know, that is something that should define Christians. Being somebody hospitable, somebody who shows you know, hospitality, they show charity to, to those who come and they're less fortunate. You know what I mean? That should be our mindset. Now, uh, 
I'll tell you, like I told, like I said, Niola, like I have reasons and I could preach a message on that. And I think it's, it's right that we don't just go giving money to every homeless person that's holding up a sign asking for money or something like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not required to go to soup kitchens. We're not like earning our salvation or something like that. Okay. But when you have an opportunity to meet, to, to, to take care of somebody's needs, like that good Samaritan, that becomes your neighbor and you're supposed to love your neighbor and you're supposed to treat them. And so you, you come across a foreigner, for the most part, foreigners in our country are, you know, they're outsiders, they're kind of less fortunate, they, they don't feel like they belong many times, they're treated badly, not always. Some of them are, you know, none of those things I just described. But oftentimes that's the case. As a Christian, we should be super hospitable, super, you know, uh, thankful that we have the opportunity to talk to them and just show them the love and the kindness that we've been showed through Jesus Christ. And I think that if we do that, we are pleasing God, uh, you know, and, and we are uh, uh, living the example, actually, that Jesus Christ showed as well. And so, uh, he said, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And isn't that the truth for the Christian life? I mean, everything that we're told to do. Love your husbands, love your wives, as unto the Lord, right? Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as in, in, unto the Lord. I think I, I, I messed up. Everything that we do, servants obey your masters, right? As is fit in the Lord. I mean, you're, everything that we do is supposed to be with the idea of I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm doing this because it pleases the Lord. And so when we are dealing with foreigners, strangers in this land, we all were once foreigners and strangers in this land to begin with, you know, our, our ancestors. But not only that, as Christians, we are foreigners and strangers in this land. So we ought to remember that. Okay. And then uh, we need to, uh, uh, what well, my second point was, the remember, we need to... Uh, I know it starts with an R, recognize, sorry, the opportunity that we have to preach the gospel to these, uh, to these folks. And then we need to reciprocate the love of Christ that was shown to us. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to, um, to preach your gospel and to not be a respecter of persons, but to just freely and happily share that with the world. Not like, not like Jonah, who uh, didn't want to go to Nineveh, uh, but Lord, we, we gladly take the gospel and we go share it. We gladly love, uh, love others, uh, to the best of our ability when we can and, uh, and, uh, share with them the gospel, share with them, uh, the love of Christ. And, uh, thank you for that great opportunity. Help this month, this upcoming month as we focus on the different, uh, people groups in the world and their needs. I pray that you will help us to just be mindful of that and that it would help us do greater works uh, with, a, with a more loving heart for, uh, for the work that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.